Welcome to the Funnel Reboot Podcast, brought to you by Marketing What's New. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're answering the question, what is different about Google Analytics 4? But first, I want to remind you that I would love your feedback on who you'd like to have on this podcast or what books we should cover. Please go ahead and get in touch on social or via the funnelreboot.com site. So we're ending our series on advancing analytics today. We're going to focus on the software that, for many marketers, is at the core of this field, Google Analytics. It was introduced in 2005 as a read-only tool that tracked basic info on our websites. The name has stayed the same over these last 18 years, but so much else of Google's technology landscape has changed. They have released many other tools, Tag Manager, Google Data Studio, now Looker Studio, ways for APIing between systems in and outside of Google, and most importantly, a place where they let you manage all of it, Google Cloud. The new Google Analytics, GA4, was born of this environment. It's been criticized as being immature since it lacks features that were in the old UA interface. However, if you judge it by how well Google integrated it into their stack and how much those with technical skills can do with it, we would rate it as ready for prime time. Add to that the fact In a matter of weeks, Google Teams won't have to maintain two analytics tools, and they'll get to focus exclusively on improving just one, GA4. We can debate Google's motives for tightly integrating GA4 with the whole Google Cloud. I'm not wading into how good or evil it is to give away a product and hope users try the paid cloud platform that comes with it. Lots of people can debate that around Google's intent. But I'll say that using Google Analytics with these other pieces lets you do much more with your data that you couldn't do with the old Universal Analytics as a free tool. And when tools directly or indirectly make money for Google, that incents them to keep those tools and to keep improving them. I'll leave it at that. Our real question, though, is how do we economically benefit from the available tools? That's what our guest is going to tell us. His book, which came out in early 2023, is called Learning Google Analytics, Creating Business Impact and Driving Insights. The business impact spoken of there doesn't mean using GA4 as a standalone lookup tool. Using it like that and ignoring what's possible would make the rest of the whole Google stack seem, to quote from the movie Contact, like an awful waste of space. Our guest knows the value of integrating Google tools for many worldwide brands, as he's done through digital agency work and on his own as a GA consultant since 2008. He has helped turn the -the out-of-the-box Google Analytics into a package that automatically describes predicts, and activates a better marketing outcome for a company. He currently works at DevoTeam as their principal data engineer. Originating from Cornwall in the UK, he gained his master's in physics at King's College London, and he now lives in Copenhagen with his wife and two children, and he likes playing music and cycling around the many lakes there. Let's go hear from Mark Edmondson. I'm so glad to welcome Mark Edmondson. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much. And really pleasure to be here. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, We are here to talk about your book, Learning Google Analytics, Creating Business Impact and Driving Insights. Um, Would you remind me again who published it? O'Reilly, who would be very pleased to mention them. And they have been very helpful, so they deserve all the credit. That's that's amazing. Now, <clears throat> for marketers, uh, marketers that read books, they're probably not used to seeing 
a publisher like O'Reilly for this book. And they may be scratching their heads saying, but I thought that Google Analytics was a tool for marketers. Why is there a IT publication, an IT publisher that's, that's putting up this book? And um, I think we need to hit this head on here. Would you be able to tell me if you think that Google Analytics is actually even built for marketers? <laughs> That is a good question, and I hadn't thought about that actually. Uh, that O'Reilly is an IT publisher, um, and yeah, but yeah, I don't think there's other Google Analytics books on there. Um, but I think it really is the sign of the times. Um, Google Analytics, okay. and is, and the times here are we're just yeah. clocking over to Google Analytics four. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and that's um, that's the crucial is it more IT focus perhaps on the applications. I don't know. Maybe we'll discuss that. Yeah. Well, well, it is, and you know, maybe we could talk a tiny bit about uh, the origin of GA four. Um, you take us in the book through the fact that uh, there was something that had to do with mobile applications and the storage of information about what happens inside of a mobile app. So, could you please pick it up from there? Yeah, that's very true. So, um, the kind of seeds of it is fire. Firebase, which is um, a mobile app application platform that is kind of a a, um, a brand within Google Cloud Platform. And um, the kind of original template for GA4 would be coming from Firebase Analytics, as it was called then. Um, and Firebase Analytics was more suited to mobile apps. So things like page views and sessions maybe weren't so familiar. It was more a place of you clicking buttons on a mobile app and apps and events. So this kind of event data schema, um, which has been uh, sort of promoted to uh, GA4 in general now. Right. And they did that in response to the marketplace, having mobile websites, and that that is just as big a part of the internet experience now um, as desktop was 10 years ago. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, Universal Analytics is a good 15 years old or something like that. Um, when it came, I think I was just there when it came, when it was launched. Uh, I can't even remember what it's called before. Um, just Google Analytics. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, I mean, mobile was just sort of starting off. You know, I'd only just got an iPhone, I think, probably, when that was uh, all kicking off. And so the internet is just a different place. We interact with the internet in a different way. Um, and Google are, you know, looking to build for the future. And so they've, um, they're sort of taking this, yeah, they're taking this sort of mobile first, maybe approach. Um, there were also two different products, which were, was a bit difficult to explain to clients sometimes about why they didn't, you know, they couldn't have the website um, metrics sort of measuring up to their mobile app metrics. Also, right. Yeah. So, so if we kind of peel that back, so in a desktop, you would go from a page to another page, and your clickstream metrics would say what you did. Not so on a mobile app where you're always in session and you're maybe just scrolling. Yes. yes. So, as you say, they they decided to unite those, and they used the platform that had been good at mobile to do that. And they also adopted a data model. So let's focus on that for a moment. Um, it's event-based with GA4, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, so yeah, the, it originally was called App and Web. Um, right. And then it kind of inherited the name G Google Analytics 4 um, when that right. happened. And um, yeah, the event data model, um, there was a lot of kind of other analytic systems that were kind of coming out as well, like Snowplow and things like that, who were in this sort of more event-based data model. And um, I think they looked around at those uh, analytic systems as well as a sort of maybe uh, influence on um, on what people will be looking for. And I think um, they also wanted to try and simplify. I don't know if they succeeded, but um, I mean, Universal Analytics had a lot of kind of bespoke data, like sessions, users, products, which were kind of a bit clodgy to um, 
to query against sometimes. So you just, as you knew Google Analytics, sometimes you knew that you couldn't combine certain dimensions and that's because they were in sort of different data models within the platform itself. And that's, I think that's GA, a great point. Yeah. G4 was trying to get around that with just sort of unifying of the, but it is, I mean, just recent updates has shown there are still some dimensions that don't work together, which, uh, you know, I thought we were trying to get a, a, around. But yeah, I think uh, I guess we, we have to, to we have to be careful. Yeah, we can conflate things that are. Uh, it's still a relatively new product, and we're comparing yes. it against a fifteen-year-old product. So yes. we we must bear in mind some of those issues. They they will have to fix them, um, yeah. but we we shouldn't necessarily uh, try to make a head-to-head -head comparison um, on those measures. On another measure, though. And this is, I think, the flip side of what you were just saying about the data model in UA. Um, you said eloquently that if the data wasn't in a UA report, it's like it didn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. So if you fell between the cracks, as it were, between pages and sessions and goals, it, it was quite difficult. Uh, or you had to shoehorn what you had into, you know, category action and label and other dimensions that they would prescribe and there were very um, creative workarounds for that using custom dimensions sure. and all of that but it was kind of square peg round hole situation sometimes right and, yeah. but so would you agree that it seemed to be more flexible because you can name these events anything and uh right. yeah effectively you can have you know any event name that you would like to have there so you can right. customize it a lot more Yes, and I guess that the mind shift needs to be, uh, if I saw it in universal analytics, um, I have to let go of the fact that if I don't see it in GA4, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All it means is that it's some event that is being tracked in GA4, but I'm just not seeing it readily available in a report. Yes, that might be the case, definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about GCP and where else that information might be found. Um, so the bulk of the book actually talks about GCP. Could you start by telling us what is GCP? Uh, yeah, Google Cloud Platform. And um, yeah, I mean, bear in mind when I was writing the book, GA4 had just come out and uh, a lot of the UI features were kind of um, still being developed as I was doing it. Yes. But um, they did always have this big query export. And um, at my job at IH, where I was at the time, IH Nordic, I was um, pri when I was working with Universal Analytics, it was mostly with the big query export for Google Analytics Premium or GA360 as it turned into. And so it was um, very, very welcome when um, GA4 was announced so that this would be available to everyone. So even if you're on the free version... Right. Um, you would get this uh, export to BigQuery, um, which automatically meant a lot of the kind of enterprise sort of features that we were doing for paying clients, maybe people could use in the free version as well. I mean, we say free, but um, there is charges for BigQuery, uh, things like that. But um, I usually say budget $100 a month or something like that, and you would probably never reach mm -hmm. that uh, for mm -hmm. a small website and things like that. Um, but yeah, so GCP and for me, definitely Google cloud platform that my route to that was through BigQuery and the universal analytics export. That was my first exposure to it. And it just so happened that BigQuery is one of Google cloud platforms, best products as well. Um, and that's kind of started me along this journey that sort of, uh, ended with me writing this book basically. Yeah. Right. And it, and it's a whole suite of tools. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but I think the way we can summarize it for a marketer is that the roadblock that we always used to have of being able to put our hands on the data in a workable format, that's now not a roadblock. No. Yeah. You've got access to the raw data always. Um, so, I mean, before you could... In Universal Analytics, you could um, query it via the API and get something close to if you did some other setup stuff, like capturing the client ID and things. But it wasn't it wasn't as um, easy to use as the BigQuery export. So 
yeah, it kind of changes the the way you think about it now because you do always have that raw data, and now the kind of GA four web application is kind of an application built on top of that data now, and so you can kind of reach into the data that's creating these um, reports on the web and um, and do your own applications as well. I'm going to quote from you here um, on how that goes. You say that uh, the effect of you know having that database in uh, data in a raw format is the age-old problem of data silos where the data you need is locked behind databases with differing company politics and policies now has a route to a solution by sending it all to one destination. Um, yes. The name yes. of that particular right. component is BigQuery, right? That's where we're sending it. Yes, yes. That is, um, and yeah, the, and the reason it's kind of the dual in the Google Cloud Platform uh, is that you can send in a lot of data to it and just kind of, um, and it will just, it's got very kind of easy APIs and easy integrations with a lot of, and you can pay someone to do it or do it yourself. And then once it's all in there, then you have a kind of web-based interface where you can, if you know SQL um, or SQL, um, you can interact with all of these data silos from kind of one pane of glass, as they say. So you could have your GA3, GA4 export in there, but then you could also have your CRM data in there, or you could have the weather uh, in there, or you know all the other. And there's like millions and millions of data sets um, you could think of. So let's talk about what we can do with this. We'll leave outside for a moment um, what technical expertise is needed. Um, I guess I'll just put a coda on what you said about you can pay someone else to do it. The good news is that though it may be sitting in areas where some technical knowledge is needed, it's all industry standard. As you said, SQL um, you know, standard languages, standard ways of storing data, using it. Um, this is something that we've had for decades uh, yeah. in other fields. So we're, we're trotting a well-worn path. The main thing that we get to leverage when we have this data together is that we can start to understand and even predict what's going to happen. Could you take us through... You know, this is one of the areas you, I can tell, get rather excited about when you write it. Yeah. What is, in your words, the power of prediction when it comes to marketing data? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think um, I've got, I think as a lot of people, we've started off with just dashboards. So you're kind of reacting to the data that's uh, given to you. So you can see what your campaign performance was last month, say. And the idea is that then you make a decision um, or you kind of have an explanation about why that happened. And then you apply those learnings to future events so that your, your business performs better in the future. Um, when you've got kind of predictions um, in place, that's kind of going through that kind of process for you in an automated fashion, say. And so if, you've, if you do have a kind of forecast or a prediction about what the campaign might be next month, then you can actually um, make changes ahead of time before it happens um, and not kind of just take the lessons and apply it to the next campaign. You can actually affect the sort of campaign that's running right now. Um, maybe you've got a prediction that um, it's going to go super, super well. And so um, you want to pour more budget into that campaign because you can see that it's, it's doing really well. Or maybe you can see it's trending to zero and maybe you should just, you know, can this campaign straight away and, and use your money more wisely somewhere else. So um, hmm. I think it just sort of speeds up the, that sort of closed loop cycle of learning and applying. Um, and it's one of the features that's sort of baked into GA4 as well. You don't need to know SQL and all that to uh, start going on that. You can definitely use it, SQL to customize it and do more of that. But it is, you've got these like new predictive metrics and predictive audiences in GA4, which, um, which does that for you. So to recap on those audiences, and it's going to sound a little bit like we are um, favoring Google Ads here. Um, I don't think that's fair. I think what we're trying to say is that Google Ads is a highly integrated product with the other parts of the Google Cloud. And so if we make an audience 
yes, we have the ability to send Google ads to it. Um, I would add that we can use the same technology with other platforms that are as sophisticated to do it with them as well. Yeah. But it, yeah. it is kind of out of the box with, with Google ads. But sure. so I mean, while we're I mean, talking, that is, that is a reason that Google Analytics is around to sell Google right. ads. You know? So right. um, if we were Google, Google, we would have done that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those audiences, as you say, so it would be something like if we could feed, if we could isolate across all of the people who've gone to our website at some point, those who are most likely to purchase or to. Um, reach revenue um, in a faster way or maybe are about to churn and leave. Um, these, these, are, these are ways that we can use large quantities of data to let machine learning find out which ones within that large pool of, aud of an audience are most likely along one of those lines. And then we can either include them or exclude them from a particular campaign we're doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they're kind of like And so uh, so one side of it is we could save money, right? Like if we yes. don't want to advertise to people who are 90% likely to walk, to buy from us Absolutely. Yeah. without any got, outside help. And and a sort of um a project I had before Google Analytics 4 was to build this kind of models and things for someone on Universal Analytics. And it was a good project. It was a great project, but it, you know, it took a lot of engineering and a lot of time uh, to do so. Um, so that's why it's one of the first use cases for this book is that you can do this without having to know lots of engineering. You push a few buttons and, um, and you've got it there kind of within the interface itself. So um, I just feel like it's kind of lowering the bar. It's kind of the, definitely when people talk to me about why should I use GA4? Uh, over universal analytics uh it was the first kind of real use right. case that made people start to get nod and go mm, yes okay that's something i should start start using yeah so modeling as you say before something like this came along was a lot of work you liken it to yeah. if a outcome or an insight of a prediction was the X on a treasure map, then the modeling would have been the path you had to uh, delineate to be able to get to it. Um, can you describe for lay people kind of how modeling works with large data sets? Uh, yeah, so modeling is more about the process of taking your raw data and turning it into useful information. So. Um, so when you, so as and I think if you kind of went through every kind of row of data that you had in your if you kind of observed every person you will start to notice patterns about if people go to a certain page um and they don't see the product that they want they might churn or go off the website immediately and what um the sort of modeling aspect is trying to do is just um automate that kind of process across lots and lots of data points so you don't have to sit there and do it all manually so it's it's about scaling up your own expertise really um and um and so the modeling process is kind of um applying looking for those patterns looking for um if this happens what happens before that that might predict what that happened before on your historic data and then if and then when they kind of get an idea about okay this looks like there's a pattern then they test it on um a sort of another data set they've got a good idea they try it out okay it looks like it's working and when you're kind of confident that that is a good predictor for the outcome that you're doing then you can start to say okay well i haven't seen this data yet but i if if it follows the same patterns as all the historic data um then this should happen if this happens, then this should happen. So uh, it's kind of it's trying to automate that process of um, of scaling yeah. up individual what you would be able to do if you were kind of spending the time on doing it, but scaling it up over thousands of pages and that kind of thing. I feel that's kind of what you were saying when you alluded earlier to dashboards. Um, that 
is something that we as humans use, maybe without realizing, to look at something and go, well, if it's going this well at this point in time and there's seasonality to what happens, then we should be doing even better when we get into high season. Uh, yes. Now, we tap out very work. quickly as humans, right? Yeah. We can't do much more than that, but computers can do way more. Yeah, I mean, that only works if they're kind of very, you know, lots of things, predictable things that happen often. I mean, the human being is is a wonderful machine and um, will always be, you know, more creative and finding the sort of new, unique things. And the machine learning stuff won't be able to ever sort of do these kind of black swan events or anything like that. But if you've got very kind of predictable patterns and things like that going through the website, then um then yes yes these are things which um are uh, have been yeah long long been able to be done um if you had the right engineering and resources to pour into it and but what we're seeing now is the bar lowering uh to access this kind of um modeling that you can do right. um, until it's available in you know one of the most popular analytics platforms um in the world right we already mentioned, you know, weather, uh, so forecasting the weather or even buying yes. life insurance. These things yeah. wouldn't have been possible without someone being able to do uh, statistical prediction. Yeah. And we do, when we're we looking to do that 25 years, you know, 30 years. Yeah, or it's, longer. It's, yeah. it's just the fact that it's democratizing now and we've, we're getting cheaper compute, cheaper storage and all of this, which is kind of making more people have access to it including the people listening to this. Yes. yes. One quick other thing I, I, I want for those people who are maybe getting freaked out by uh, thinking that this is intruding on privacy. Um, I'm speaking to you in Europe and you point out in the book that Europeans have a, a tougher sensibility when it comes to privacy for us. So let's be clear on what we're not doing here. We are not using a computer model like Skynet to predict what Mark is going to do tomorrow on a website. This is looking at a large pool and this is using a certain accuracy rating on saying so many people within this group will do the following X percent of the time, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is an evolving thing and I think US is catching up fast as well um, to what the EU is doing around the world as well. But um, uh yeah, there's no need to have this kind of um, stalking around the internet, tracking everything that you're doing, sending all your information to one company, say, or something like that. Um, the, you can you can do it on a sort of campaign level, say. Um, and there are actual thresholds when you're in GA4 looking at the um, at using predictive metrics. They won't do it if it's below a certain threshold. And one of the main reasons of that is that it could then potentially... If, the, if your audience is only the size of one person, then that w- that's like identifying a person. So you have to have a threshold of um, like 100 people. So it's a similar like a postcode. So, you know, if you knew your address and your postcode, you have enough information to go to that person's house. But if you only have one postcode, then you haven't, you know, you, you can't go specifically to the house. But this is where Europe and legislation is very cautious because if you do take that data and then combine it with other data, like um, you've got green car and you your postcode is this, then cross-referencing those two pieces of data, you could maybe right. narrow it down to you know too much to people. So that's what a lot of the privacy legislation is looking to make sure doesn't happen. Sure. Without sure. But just flip. But just flipping it around to the probability side, let's say, for example, I don't know, for argument's sake, let's say that I sell a green uh, little vial of uh, repair paint for cars, and I put that in the hardware stores in a certain locality. Um, I would I would be good with an 80% accuracy yeah, prediction yeah. that there are green vehicles in that area and that's good enough for me to know that I should advertise in that area and send people to that store Absolutely. and that I'll make I money. Mean, and that's the sort of irony of a lot of the uh, privacy legislation and all this. I mean, a lot a lot of it, it doesn't need individual, uh, you know, what they're worried about. They doesn't need the individual targeting to have very effective um, outcomes for marketers. Like campaign level, 
is 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 more than adequate in a lot of cases. And there was I, I also believe there was a kind of myth as well of micro targeting. There was a lot of you know if we be able to like know everything about a person, we can serve them up the perfect ad, and they're definitely going to click it. You know because they're just going to be so compelled by all this information. Um, and I don't think that happened very much, if at all. Um, I think you you know if you can generally just have sort of demographics like age and gender, that's going to be the main predictors about what you're doing in life and not like that you wore blue shoes yesterday. And uh, No, no, I, I think we come back to, no, it, I mean, good old, you know, college economics, you know, they tell us about yes, the supply yes. and demand and where they meet. Yeah. So a business doesn't need to go to that extreme length and yeah. the consumer doesn't need to be so concerned about their individual privacy uh, that they're, you know, using blockers and all these things, because if it's just good enough, uh, then everyone will come away with a win. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, from an ethical standpoint, don't want to implement anything that would target people or anything like that. And I don't believe I have, to my knowledge, um, to the best of my knowledge. So, um, yeah, and I don't believe it's effective. And, um, yeah, you can still get very good results. <laughs> Uh, exactly. So I want us to dig into how we go through getting those results and what kind of an undertaking it is. But before we do that, we're going to take a really quick break. I'm taking a moment to talk about the new Google Analytics. In early 2023, the in-person GA fast forward workshops will happen in Ottawa, Kingston, Montreal, as well as across upstate New York. You can go now and see registration details or get notified when it's happening in your area. Just go to gafastforward.com, spelled as you'd say it, or gafast, the number four, then W-A-R-D. Let's get back to the conversation. Okay, Mark. So you have uh, outlined through the book in painstaking for fashion, um, how we can go from just an idea of what we want to achieve uh, and how we can uh, reach it. Um, you take us through four steps. You say that, you know, we have to first ingest the data. We got to pull it from the places that we need it. We have to model it. Then we have to uh, activate it uh, somewhere in the mix there. We also have to reckon with the storage. Um, this is um, some of these steps will be unfamiliar to your friendly neighborhood marketers. Um, we have kind of dealt with model, but could you maybe just tell us activate, you know, have we already kind of discussed the activation of data? And if so, where yeah, did I we think do this that? Is probably a bit of my terminology, um, but I think a lot of people, and I think a lot of people are familiar with the concepts, but maybe under different names, but I would just say before all of that, I do stress that you need to have a good business case. Um, and that is actually the uh, very difficult to, to get a good business case really sort of fleshed out. And I mean, and the irony is, is that in agencies is that a lot of the time you leave it to the client who might be the most inexperienced. You know, the reason they've got an agency is they're looking for expert help. And then that who's experts are saying to that very inexperienced person, Right, you have to set this uh, business case, which is the critical to the entire project. Um, you know, go for it, and we'll just do yes. what you do. So, I think an agency should help <laughs> um, with that as well. But then, once you've got a good business case, then um, the you, I just believe that you're always going to have to, at some point, think about those four things that you mentioned, which is collecting the data, where you store it, um, the modeling that we covered before, and the activation. And the activation is really where you get the business value out of your data. And this is from just experiences where I followed all the, you know, best practices of creating dashboards and making really like amazing dashboards, you, you know, works of art uh, and all this uh, completely tailored to what the client wanted and all of that. And then you're watching the usage of those dashboards because you could add your tracking to yes. and just seeing no one logging into them <sighs> after about three weeks, you know, 
and you've, you've had a six month project or something to design these and then no one logs in and um and it, you know it wasn't wasn't me is it something i did but um you know i think nowadays actually the company i'm at they've got a good sort of business in change management uh, at Dever team and i think that is uh it's a dedicated place where if you're going to introduce the dashboards, then to activate it and get business value out of it, the people consuming that have to make decisions. As I said earlier, they have to make decisions. They have to react to that information. And if that is not happening, then it's a bad dashboard. They have, you know, the, yeah. Is the, no, I appreciate how you pushed it back onto the stakeholder. You said in one place, describe what you would do with the data that you don't have now. Yes. And and that's hard for people to do uh, to it's, imagine it's something. Difficult questions, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the if you, bit, I'm kind of ha- completely happy with you know. Right. Code, da, 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 da. But the yeah, that is. That Why is do you need it? Yeah. Now on the computer side, if you're doing it with machine learning, uh, as you point out in some examples you roll through, that the business case can be quite straightforward. You, for example, say, "Here's what we were spending to acquire you know this amount of business." Uh, before and in the after we would be let's say you know pushing ads more surgically or we would not be showing ads at certain times and if we do it this way even counting the amount of effort it takes to make this facility uh we're still coming out ahead yeah yeah and i i just try and give some examples it's difficult in a book because you you just think of idealized idealized um examples but hopefully i mean all of it all the book is about trust trying to inspire how it would apply to your own situation um and yeah i mean um there's the cost of actually you know the people who are doing it um there's the cost of the cloud sometimes if it's significant or not um um and then and it's getting to the question of the ROI of analytics, which is throughout my career has always been a difficult question. You know, I've got this whole department of analysts, you know, what value am I getting out of them? Um, so um, that is not a settled question, but hopefully um, what the getting at least some figures um, for the business use case sort of at least helps to quantify it a little bit for when you're doing this thing. Yes, the thing I appreciated as well was that the first idea that you land on for what you might do, um, it may not be the easiest or the highest ROI of the group. So you had said you need to uh, maybe think of logging several of them. Um, At the end of the book, you point out, you you kind of paint a picture of what heaven would look like for you. And in your version of heaven, uh, there's like a two-year roadmap of all the different projects. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know any companies that, you know, have, have reached that heaven for you, but I'll be calling you when they, when I see one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think I ever met one. Well, I, I did, I did meet some people who were very close actually um, at the end, but, um, and it's, it's under, I mean, I think we used to do this thing of a, a workshop basically in, and just brainstorm lots of people. And often that workshop was quite um, good in, in just in that it got people from different departments around the business in the same room. And they would like talk to each other in the first, for the first time, maybe sometimes about data and their business needs and things like that. Um, And that, that's part of the sort of change management thing about it, getting people invested in, um, in the solution and, and that kind of thing. Yes. No, um, yeah. I, I saw there were two components to how um, we can differentiate an easy project from a hard project. Um, one of them kind of made business sense. It was if you do not have fields of information that are important to your business that are being captured at the point where they would be known and then uh travel down or maybe be able to join up with tables in other systems later on. So there's, you have to think of custom fields and that can obviously add to the cost of uh, making, making some application like this. But the other one is, and you go into quite a bit of length uh, on this is the piping of data. Some call it data engineering, uh, moving it from point A to point B and there are a myriad of ways of doing it um you go into the book within google cloud it has these weird beasts like 
PubSub and Dataflow and a host of others. You know, there's cloud storage, um, staging areas, you know, ways to get stuff either streamed or batched. Um, how do you advise a non-technical person to at least understand enough about this to know that there could be some cost in getting the data and, and that you will have to use different tools depending on where your data is currently sitting? Yeah, I think, I mean, definitely for your first use cases, sticking to one data source is advisable, um, such as Google Analytics 4. Um, but just know that every time you introduce a new data source, it's um, there's a it kind of increases um, by the power each time. So, so if you have two, okay, you can just about do that. You still need the key, but three, that's not, you know, it's not three times as hard as having one. It's probably six times, um, four, five, six. So it, it increases very, very rapidly. And um, and then I would definitely advise for your first project to not worry about real-time um, data. Um, that is always the request that happens. We want a real-time dashboard for blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've got, yeah, there's a story like someone was asking for that for the, like the brand of shoes that they were looking at on the website. So they had real time data about what were the most popular shoes and they go, okay, we've got this real time data. These pink shoes are doing really well. We're going to put in it in production. And in six months time, we're going to have these uh, pink shoes sort of, you know, ramped up in production. And you just can't, if you can't react in real time, there's no point having real time data, you know? Um, but so that's kind of a, a, a good sort of um, question to ask yourself, do I really need real-time data or is it okay every week or every day is usually fine, completely yeah. fine. And that'll yeah. keep just your costs down, your um, simplicity of the solution down um, and a lot of things, yeah, quicker, quicker to actually getting the project done um, and getting the results um, for what you need to do right so there's a few of those places where we can imagine that we're aggregating a little bit or we're waiting until a full day or a full week has accrued um yeah. you you point out especially when it comes to the data even between different products like if we're going to try to put it into looker studio and you know make decisions on it moving that data between we could be, if we're not careful, incurring higher costs uh, just because of the data uh, and the API calls that that's triggering. So there are considerations here that uh, a marketer may want to talk with somebody who's more technically savvy um, before they yeah. require something, like you say, real time and not knowing that it's going to drive the cost way up. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a point at which that cost makes it just no longer tenable for the business case. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, once you've got that kind of a value figure, like, you know, this is going to make us, I mean, you can have wild guesses about what these figures are. I mean, no one's going to, but at least just having kind of a bit of a commitment, like this is, I expect this to save me a million dollars or something like that next month. Um and then it's only one dollar or Ouch. ten million dollars, but it's like um, at least there's some kind of you know goalposts that you can be aiming at ballpark. Switching tax for a moment. There's a product we haven't talked about anywhere here, but it can play a role in how some of this data is collected, particularly custom data, and uh, it's Google Tag Manager. You. Yeah took me into some new areas that I wasn't familiar with when you were describing the alternate way of implementing Google Tag Manager to be able to store some of these independent fields. So if I'm a person who only knows Google Tag Manager as something that I've installed and is just running, what is this other thing that you're talking about? Are you talking about server-side yes. Tag Manager? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's the future of tag management systems. So if you haven't heard about it yet, you will hear about it in the next few years. Um, simply and largely because of the sort of, um, br browser restrictions and legislation that's coming in, um, third party cookies, for example, are, are not going to be around. They keep saying they're not going to be around. They keep moving the, 
date when it's not going to be around, but eventually <laughs> they're not going to be around. Um, and so sort of t- um, tag server side tagging is basically where you move the work of um, your tag manager system. You move it, uh, you don't have all, at the moment, it's all working in the browser of the person who's viewing the website. So it's all kind of running on their computer, really, in their browser. It's JavaScript that's running in the browser. Um, and with server side tag manager, you kind of move some of that processing into a server that you control. And um, it doesn't have to be on Google Cloud Platform, but it often is. Um, but it can be on um, a computer that you control. Um, and you're and you're then hosting your own sort of tag manager system, basically. And when you are hosting it, you just have a lot more control about um, what data you are sending to your different vendors. So that could be Google Analytics or it could be Facebook, it could be all of that. Um, the current situation is JavaScript runs inside the browser and you just put these tags on your website and, and you have no idea really what, they, what they're collecting and what they're sending. You know, there's some due diligence, but a lot of people just whack them on and they could do anything they like. And, you know, Facebook's got in trouble <laughs> for, for doing this. Uh, it was, you know, tracking Every time you put a Facebook like on a page, you know, you are actually sending a lot of information to Facebook, for instance. Um, so with server-side uh, tag management, you can basically inspect the data before you send it out um, to, to different vendors. Um, and um, it also speeds up your website a little bit, maybe, because um, you are moving more of the work away um, from, from the browser. Um, and um, yeah, and the fact that it's running on your server as well means that um, you can then enhance that data before it, it says so you may want to redact data. So maybe take away IDs. You don't want to send Google Analytics certain IDs or Facebook certain IDs, but you can also add data to it as well. So for instance, maybe at the moment you've got your products uh, all listed in a big sort of file um, on your website and you send all of that information each time someone views one of your products. And it's a lot, you know, the brand, the uh, price, all of this type of stuff. Um, if you can enhance that data on the way in, then all you need, really need to do is send in the product ID. And then when it's on the server, then you can enhance it in a, in a, in your server. So it's away from the customer. So, um, they don't get that extra load on their, on their browser. Um, and you can, so, and it's actually a lot easier, um, for some companies to, um, to update it there rather than on the website. Cause, um, it can be difficult to get changes implemented, uh, on the website, changing the data layer and all sure. this. I'm sure a lot of your listeners have. This, we've we've felt projects. this pain. Yes. Yes. Huge projects of getting <laughs> your data that you need, um, in the data layer, um, because it's kind of. A different system really for a lot of uh, back-end engineers so when you've got server-side management it's actually a bit more familiar to them i think um if instead they're updating they say a firebase or firestore database with that product information they may, may they may even already have it there right um and then you just need to connect to that in your server-side environment um so it's yeah it's definitely the way forward um, I would expect every kind of enterprise solution to have be running server side tag management in the next say five years or something like that. Yeah. So there's there's definitely like a DIY component to this that we're having to gain more you know technical know how or uh, in house resources to do this. But we are starting you know just if I look at GTM server side as well as what you've mentioned about uh, custom audiences um, and the other things. This do-it-yourself approach, though, is giving us in-house the power that formerly we were just seeing from the likes of Facebook and Google Ads. I mean, they have, Facebook's had it the longest, but they both have the uh, information about their particular audiences we can we have felt that when we've for example turned on a lookalike audience in facebook and been amazed at how well it you know can find the people who are exactly who we're looking for yeah but if we do this as well they take that information from your own website as well because well this this is what i'm saying this is now just us expropriating what 
they had been doing and doing more of it on our own. And for anybody, I suppose, who's deflated by the thought of how much work this is and how technological it is, I guess your response back would be, but you own it. You now have ownership of the thing that you were previously yeah. paying rent for. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, you know, I do wonder, is maybe, is it just how, you know, it's going when we used to be able to go to the bank and they would do it all for you. Right. And now That's you right. Know, have to fill in all the forms yourself and, you know, you've got it on your mobile phone and all this, all that. <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're actually doing a lot of the work that, you know, I have to go to the supermarket to get my milk and all this. Um, so, yeah, but I think uh, it's difficult for me to to uh, divorce the my experience of, of analytics with how the industry has been going. But I have the impression that it has got, there is more technical things you can do rather than just having this sort of software as a service, Google Analytics set it up the defaults and it will kind of give you data. And there's still solutions that will do that for you. But I think the demand for the, from the users of that has always been to have more control, you know, and more, um, yeah, d- data democratization. And so I think it, ha- it has responded to the, to the demand of, of more technical people, perhaps, um, why can't we just build our own system? Why, do, you know, why use this thing where we're given all of this sort of schema? Why can't we define it ourselves and things like that? And I think Google is a very sort of developer friendly company in general, right? So um, they are going to be biased towards kind of those kind of solutions. I suppose. Right. So, so their answer is provided you know how to do it, we'll give you the tools. Yeah, exactly. But they ha- they have tried to make it, easier so i mean there is things like auto i mean you know the news this week is that they're going to auto upgrade your universal analytics to ga4 which i definitely wouldn't do but for some people that is brilliant right because they're just like oh you know i was getting worried about doing all this and now i just have to sort of sit here and not do anything right. and they'll do it for me and there's things like the auto tagging i mean it is simpler i would say for a lot of things like so, things like click tracking and youtube tracking um, before you in Universal Analytics, you did have to configure that yourself. Um, whereas GA4, it all kind of comes out of the box. You don't have to update your tagging and things. So I think they are trying to. It's it's trying to serve up two different things, and I think they are sometimes caught between two different sort of, you know, trying to please everyone in some cases, um, where you've got a lot of defaults at the box. It'll do kind of things. But also, they want to make it very customizable. Yeah, um, within the UI, there's there's more that they're trying to do. But uh, every single thing that they've put in, you know, if I imagine it like an iceberg, and the UI is just the part we see above the water, there has yeah. been so much more that they have put in below the water line. And provided you can uh, work comfortably in the slightly more technical interface of Google Cloud and and these other tools. You, you have access to that. Um, and I, I want to just finish. That is, yeah, that, I think that is a reflection of the, it is still being developed, you know? Yeah. And I think they have started with the foundations, which is the big creator. And that's the kind of thing that I wrote about. But the, there's, it's going to be iterated a lot on the web UI and things like that as it goes on as well. So maybe it'll go in the direction where more and more things you don't have to sort of reach into these other tools as well there'll be more kind of features surfaced in the web UI. You've had the chance to work with some enterprises um, and e-commerce businesses that have, you know, been under the imperative to use these tools and, you know, bring in whatever expertise is needed to sell their product on a website. Um, I guess we'll finish with that gaze into the future. You say that, you know, some of these things may be in the UI or that we may be able to do them with very low code, maybe no code uh, type of work. Um, do you imagine that the net net of that will be that midsize and even small businesses will in the not too distant future be able to use some of these you know, AI driven features for their marketing? Um, well, definitely already with the predictive metrics, you do need a volume 
to do that. But um, as was mentioned before, because we've got this big query export and because we've got the API and all this type of things, there is a lot of scope for companies to sort of treat Google Analytics 4 as just the kind of source of the data and then build these things on top. So, I mean, I'm an open source advocate and all this, so I hope there are companies that will spring up maybe um, to kind of offer these services as well, you know. Um, you know, if there is a demand for it, if there is demand for a more software as a service sort of approach uh, to that, then um, perhaps we won't have to wait for Google to do, to develop it. And it maybe it'll come, but, you know, it's on the roadmap, all this. But maybe there's going to be this kind of middleware of people who are going to kind of um, be able to work with that data. And, and then, yeah. So I wonder if that will happen as well. I don't. You, you give a couple of paths, right? Like another path in the book, pretty clear, is a microservice where you literally gave us, yeah. you know, if you can type out this one page of code and drop it into here and set up these other things, this will work. It's typo free. It's been tested. Yes, it works. <laughs> and it works. It's still working. I'm checking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have you to thank because it's probably, you know, bruises on your knuckles and scars on your knees that have been <laughs> needed to get well, us yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, you only see the finished result. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you see the other 10 burnt cakes in the oven. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, Mark, I'm so glad you wrote the book. And I would encourage people, despite the fact that I think marketers might look at the title, Learning Google Analytics, and then flip it open and think that the title does not match the innards of the book, I would encourage them to get into it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think uh, yeah, it is, um, it is a book aimed at people who have been working with Google Analytics a while and, you know, are a bit familiar with the tagging and scripting and things like that. Um, so, yeah, there is... Um, but yeah, inspiration is my yes. key for it. Yeah. So even if you're not sitting there coding it yourself, all this inspiration, you're inspired about what you could be doing. Um, right. Spark the creativity. And I, I'm just talking about my own career as well. It is, it's definitely helped me in my career doing this type of stuff. And this book is basically a, re a record of what I was doing the last couple of years Um working for our clients. Like, like, like you say, you're proof that someone can be inspired even though they don't know how to do something and then they can teach themselves how to do it and use the community to help them along the way. Absolutely. And it is, and I, I've learned from the analytics community definitely as well. So that's why I've got that section at the end about all the people who have inspired me um, in there because it's definitely, you know, partly their book as well in a lot of ways. That's awesome. Well, I can say I'm one guy. You've inspired me. Uh, so I thank you again for the book. If people Absolutely. want to find it yeah. or find out more about you, Mark, where should they go? Uh, I've got a website, um, code.markedmondson.me, which should say a lot that it starts with code, not www. Um, and I'm on Twitter. Hopefully Twitter survives, you know, but uh, I'm on Twitter at Hollowmarks as well. So I hang out there a lot. And the Measure Slack channel as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been really good. I know you've left us with a lot to think about on Google Analytics and how we can use it to make our funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.